All right, everyone. So we are continuing in a series titled Jesus People. I'm going to try to kind of trim some of my illustrations up a bit so we, we fit within a certain amount of time, but we're going to make it work. Sound good? You're with me. I can see it. I can hear it too. Fantastic. All right. So we've been in a, uh, a, a series titled Jesus People. Uh, we've been looking at Matthew chapters 8 through 12, and what we've been doing in that time is exploring the topic of discipleship based on what we read in the Gospels, where Jesus, he called these, these people. He said, hey, come follow me. They did. And um, what that ultimately meant for them. And so uh, you can go to the next slide, Richard. Just a brief, brief review uh, first week, we talked about the cost of following Jesus. Second week, we talked about how Jesus calls us, even, you know, even me. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm not always the most lovable person, but yet Jesus has love for even me. Amen? Amen. I hope that's an amen for you too. So, uh, our third week, we talked about the practice of contending in our faith, how discipleship leads us to do certain spiritual practices, and that's all through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We respond to Him when He speaks to us, and that's a very good thing. We talked about our fourth week, the idea of carrying. We carry something uh, with us as we follow Jesus, that Jesus actually gives us uh, both His authority and his mission, his mandate to, you know, seek and save the lost, he gives that to us to carry as disciples, as people who follow him. And so our fifth week, we talked about the other side of the equation, that there's not just all the people who love Jesus, hopefully many of us here in this room do, uh, but that there's also a group that we might call the crowds and the cynics, uh, not the official like Greek philosopher cynics per se, but people who just are skeptical, people who think, ah, Jesus, what are, I don't understand you and I don't like you, <laughs> you know? Uh, and then there's the crowds, the people who are, you know, they're curious about Jesus, but then they're like, I don't know what to make of this. I guess I'm going to stick around and see what I can see. Um, and so the big question of that week is, are you paying attention? Sixth week, we talked about grace, how the, Jesus invites us into following him. He, he calls out to the crowd. He says, come follow me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And how that invitation is an invitation to experience and participate and practice grace in our lives where we, we receive it and we apply it. It's not something we learn, or we earn, but it's something that we uh, we. we we do by, by following Jesus, and he teaches us in that place. Last week, we talked about, the big idea then was that Jesus' people participate and, par and partner with good found in his name. And if you want to, you know, revisit some of that stuff, we have all the messages for the last seven weeks on our church website, as well as YouTube, and so catch up that way. Rah, rah. Here we go. <laughs> Richard, you can go to the following slide. Okay, today's message is how. I love these one-word titles because you never know what you're going to get. But the how, the how of discipleship, so to speak. Our passage is Matthew 12, 22 through 37. And our big idea today is that the work of God's kingdom is only possible by the power of the Holy Spirit. The work of God's kingdom is only possible by the power of the Holy Spirit. We might have a lot of good plans. We might have a lot of good strategies and even like put in all the effort that we got. But if we don't have God in there, it's not enough. We need him. We need him to build his kingdom here, both in our hearts and in our midst. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about that today. You can go to the following slide. Okay, I have two contrasts here and it's on purpose. You're welcome. Um, so on, on the left, we have a pipe organ in the Asbury Seminary where recently there was a 
some kind of awakening, so to speak. There's a lot of different verbiage around it, but something that God was doing among the students there, and we praise God for that. But there's a pipe organ. And then on the right, you know, you got the, uh, 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 all the glory of the modern worship era in one snapshot <laughs> of lights, band, crowd, Rah, right there. Now, why I bring this up? So all this week, I've been chewing on this message and chewing on what, trying to think, okay, how am I going to try to communicate this because it's such an important thing and I really think it's important and I really want us to understand it. So the pipe organ conjures up a lot of different imagery for, for some of us. Some of us good, some of it bad. Now, uh, I did a little research, and evidently the pipe organ, believe it or not, has been around since like Greco-Roman days. It's amazing what you learn on the internet, and also terrifying at times, but this was good. So pipe organs have been around that long. They were first introduced into the church uh, by Charlemagne, who was the French king uh, in like 600 AD. Um, and then, you know, a couple of years later, the Pope decided, hey, pipe organs are a thing. We should make this a thing. We'll put it in all the churches. It'll be great. Fast forward about a, a thousand years, and uh, literally, and you get the Reformation movement happening. And within that movement, there was this great shedding of idolatry, so to speak, where they were just really feeling like we need to get back to basics. Whatever is not basic is worldly, and we don't want to be worldly, so we're going to throw it all out. And so um, there were people, I have notes, I do have notes today, um, who said they, they characterized it this way. They called it the devil's bagpipe, <laughs> the pope's bagpipe. I'm pretty sure they like cross, use that phrase. Uh, and I'm not calling the Pope the devil, by the way, just for the record. Now, uh, they called it the devil's trumpet, because trumpet sounds in the organ, come on, uh, and a seducer to the worship of the Roman Antichrist. Whoo, scathing. All right, I mentioned that because there were people who were so convinced that pipe organs were evil that they threw them away, they melted them down, and in the whole nine yards, they just got rid of the pipe organs. And yet, for how many of us here today would we love to hear a pipe organ? And we have a setting on the keyboard who, that can do that, by the way. Compared to today, we have modern worship. And Today's message is not about worship, by the way, but it's about attributing things to like certain actions or things we observe, the concept of evil and how we can demonize things. There are many of you where like you find this church expression, you love it and it is perfect and it is just for you. There are other people where that that picture of like all the lights and the pizzazz, and blah, that is home for them. And yet how many times are there people even in this church, believe it or not, who would look at that and be like, oh, that's not of God. That's, oh, that's worldly. We need to throw out all those lights, throw out all those instruments, throw out all that everything and get back to basics. The problem is not the stuff, it's our hearts. And the problem is not what you experience with all those things. It's the fact that like, there's ways that we need to connect with the Lord. I was reminded by a dear sister this morning that she connects with the Lord through hymns. That's one of the reasons I wanted to lead out with that. It's becoming a hymn at this point, but, you know, a classic chorus that we all can sing together that is kind of, uh, it's an, a normative thing for 
the church to sing that song, I love you, Lord, I lift my voice. And so today, Jesus is going to speak into this moment in the Gospels where something radically awesome happens. And Jesus has a lot of whew, fiery things to say. So buckle up, buttercup. Here we go. So if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, beginning in verse 22. I'll be reading from the NIV this morning. That's what's up on the screen. Um, whatever translation you have in front of you is A-OK -okay with me. Let, it, let us read together. All right. Then they brought him, meaning Jesus, a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. Whew, wow. All the people were astonished and said, could this be the son of David? But the Pharisees, when they heard this, they said, it is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your people drive them out? Woo! So then, they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who seeks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Make a tree good, and its fruit will be good. Make a tree bad, and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you, who are evil, say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. So, that's the word of the Lord, recorded in Matthew's gospel for us. Jesus is, he, he doesn't mince words. <laughs> he doesn't anyway, but he doesn't hear. The first thing I see in our passage is that, you know, Christ's savings, saving power shown, it produces a reaction. Christ's saving power shown produces a reaction. You can go to the next slide. Um, so, there are three reactions I see. Number one, I see a simple face. So prior to this, um, Jesus had gone out to desolate places, and the crowd followed him, and he healed them all. That's what we covered last week. And at this point, at the very beginning, it says then, and that really means that, you know, within the course of time, it doesn't tell us exactly when, but Following those events, some people who had been witness to Jesus doing all this stuff and saying all these things, they realized, hey, I got this friend who's blind and mute, and it seems that, you know, this is not just a normal blind and mute situation, that this is just like, ah, this is bad. So we have this simple faith that Jesus has something that can help my friend, so I'm going to take my friend and I'm going to take him to there. And they did, and Jesus healed them. 
There you go. Nothing more is said in the passage about that man, which is amazing, because the emphasis isn't really on that healing, even though the healing is what caused this whole chain reaction to take place. So that's the first reaction. Somebody heard about Jesus, they responded in faith. Second one is a skeptical curiosity. So Jesus does this healing, and then the crowd says, could this be the son of David? I read a commentary this week that it's more properly, like if we were to literally like convey the idea, it's like, this couldn't be the son of David, could it? That's like the way it's phrased in, in the original language, that that's the heart behind it. It's, they see it, they know something's different about it, but they're like, that can't be, could it? And so a skeptical curiosity is a reaction. We see God at work, and we can say, there's that reaction of like, I don't, I can't believe that, but is that really possible? Amazing. And the third, which really launches Jesus into his big, uh, big pontification, <laughs> is that it's a scathing assumption. The Pharisees, they're there. They always seem to be there because they want to catch Jesus in the act of something crazy. And they say, well, it's only by the prince of demons that he does this. Clearly, it's an evil thing. Throw Jesus out with the bathwater. And there are these three reactions that I see. And I would ask you as a point of application, how have you reacted to seeing God work powerfully in your world, whatever it might be? Is it kind of that simple faith where, God, I don't necessarily understand this, but I'm trusting you that you're doing something, so I'm going to respond in faith? Is it that skeptical curiosity? Is it that scathing assumption of like, that's too far out of my comfort zone. It's got to be evil, so therefore, I'm just going to call it evil. Has that been your reaction? Or something else? Because this is just what shows up in our passage. There could, as many people are in this room, as many people are in our town, there are reactions to Jesus, and they might fall within similar categories, but that's what we see. Where are you at? Now, if it is true, and I believe it is, that the work of God's kingdom is only possible by the power of the Holy Spirit, something's going on in this passage. Let's find out more together. Go to the next slide. Thank you, Richard. The second thing I see in our passage is that Jesus points out that kingdoms rise with solidarity and they fall with sabotage. He points out how, you, just speaking plainly, like if you, have you ever when you're reading the Bible or when you're praying, you're like, God, just shoot it to me straight. <laughs> just, just lay it on me. That way there's no confusion. I want it crystal clear, please. <laughs> please don't muddy the water on this one. I just need a direct line to you. Jesus is giving us a direct line. He is very clear. I love it. Um, so right out of the gate, he says, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. How true is that? Now, it's become cliche for us to, and people use it all the time. I use it myself, uh, even though I would argue I had it first. The idea of, like, better together, that whole phrase that's becoming like a clarion call within our culture, it's kind of true. If you are together and you're solidifying that relationship and you're not working against each other, then you can actually do something and hopefully some good. Wouldn't it be amazing? Now, I promise you, I'm not going to preach politics from the pulpit, but wouldn't it be amazing if our government wrapped their heads around that one? Because we are so polarized that we're working against each other from both sides. Wouldn't it be amazing if we stopped all that? And I could get on my high horse about that, but I'm not because this is about something completely different. But the idea stands that 
Kingdoms rise with solidarity. They stand firm. They are upheld. And when there's division, it sabotages the whole thing. Now, you can go to the next slide. So that's how kingdoms work. Jesus, he lays it out. And that's how division works. If you ever want to um, see where one of the biggest black eyes within the church lies... It's in the fact that we're divided most of the time over one issue or another. Now, as a pastor, I will shoot this to you straight. More often than not, it's not a doctrinal issue. It's not anything that has to do with in this book. It's not about the theologies that come from this book. It is over petty stuff that doesn't matter a hill of beans. Now, I'm trying to censor myself, really, because, like, I'm fired up about this. <laughs> and there you go. But that's what division does. And then we see Jesus points out that in light of all of this, where it doesn't make sense that Satan would drive out Satan. That works against Satan's kingdom. Do I need to spell this out for you people? Like, Jesus is just very clear, and he's forthright, and it's like, it doesn't make sense. But then he throws into the mix in verse 28, but if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Wow. Jesus is shooting it to us straight, and he's basically saying, Look, I'm not doing this by the spirit of Satan. I'm doing it by the spirit of the Lord. And that's why the kingdom is advancing. That's why this blind and mute person who somehow was oppressed by demons was delivered, which started that whole chain reaction. Now, that leads me to consider for you and I, If that's how kingdoms work, and that's what division does, and the Holy Spirit is at work even right now in this place, then I would submit to you that we must abandon... Oh, sorry. No, no. Let me erase that. Erase that last five seconds. We must not abandon... That's why I wrote this down, so I don't, remember, I don't forget it. We must not abandon practical reason in our pursuit of spiritually discerning our experiences of God's kingdom here and now. Meaning, don't stop thinking <laughs> in this area. Really consider, really reason it out of like, okay, I see this. Now, how do I categorize that? And I have some, some things to consider. You can go to the next slide. There are some areas that we need to consider. First, is it biblical? Is it something you can either find in this book or not? And if it's in this book, what does the book have to say about it? Okay. Second thing, does it line up with God's character? We already know from all the series that we've been doing, and if we were to read and like just sit down and read all the scriptures that have to do with it, that God is a compassionate God and that he sees us in our lost state, our helpless state, and he reaches out and he wants to help us. Jesus embodied that. Here's this man who was demon oppressed and the Pharisees are having a heyday about it when it lines up with God's character. Hello, does it line up with God's character? Is what we're experiencing, is what we're observing, is that God? Does that look like God? Does that look like how God would act? If so, let's not be against it. Let's at least test it and be like, okay, God, are you sure? Because this is outside of my comfort zone and I don't know about it, but are you sure? That's a big deal. Third, is it gospel-oriented? Does it point people to Jesus? Does it point them to the truth that God saves and God alone saves by his grace through faith? 
is it gospel-oriented? Does it point us to Jesus or to ourselves? Does it lead us to following Jesus more or just to chasing after our feelings? Now, I'm not against feelings. I think feelings are fantastic, and I think emotions are great barometers for us. But make no mistake, like we've been talking about for so many weeks, there's a cost to following Jesus. It's hard. It's difficult. It's not easy. It's not always, ooh, good feels. But it's good. So with all these things, if we were to consider all these questions, and I know this is not an exhaustive list of questions for us to do a litmus test on, but this is at least step one for us to consider. When we observe something out in the world, does it fit those categories? And if not, then we don't have to worry about it and we can say like, okay, that's not of God. But if it is, we need to be so careful about casting judgment on it for these reasons. Okay, our big idea, it happens to be our third point for today. I see that the work of God's kingdom is only possible by the power of the Holy Spirit. So did you notice in verse 29, there's this strange little phrase where Jesus says, or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man, then he can plunder the house. What is going on there? Well, I'm glad you asked because I've thought about it a whole lot. Um, And as best I can understand it is that this is like an application of Jesus saying, so here's what I just did. In the power of the Holy Spirit, this is what I just did. By God's Spirit, I bound up the demon and I removed it right? Isn't that what it would seem like, kind of, maybe? I don't know. It it feels that way. If I'm wrong on this one, let's talk it out, everybody. But it's just this idea of, like, binding the enemy, and that it's by God's Spirit that we can bind the enemy, and that we can actually, you know, Yeah, the carry out his possessions thing, I don't know what to do with that per se, except for the idea of like that there's a removal of what's wrong. And it doesn't show up in the passage, but in other places in the gospel, we know that Jesus says, when a house is clean like that, you need to fill it with God's spirit and with the things of the Lord. Okay, but that's not where it stops, folks. So there's that binding and there's the removal. And that's a reference, I think, I would submit to you, and I'm willing to be wrong on that one, one little bit of that application, but that it would refer to the blind and mute demoniac that we got to see healed at the very beginning of the passage. But then Jesus launches into right out of the gate from there. He then goes into this whole section about talking about blaspheming the Holy Spirit and how that's the only unforgivable sin. So many of us myself included, and people in my family, we get hung up if we take the Lord's name in vain. So many of us, we get hung up if we relapse in, into whatever sin or habit or hang-up we have. Now, don't get me wrong, there's gravity to those things, and Jesus, he's not discounting them, but he is saying that, like, all of that, even criticizing Jesus, can be forgiven but not speaking and criticizing the Holy Spirit. And that's a hard thing. And so I've been trying to think through application of like, how do you talk about that? And I can't tell, I can't remember, is this the moment that we're gonna, no, that's coming up. So what may be and what is not blaspheming the Holy Spirit, I don't think it's what we think it is. In that, so many times we can, well, within the passage, I think it is a misattribution or mislabeling or like attributing to the enemy something that the Lord is doing. 
kind of like in our original example of like, well, the pipe organ is certainly of the devil. Maybe, <laughs> maybe not, okay? But are we really, if God is meeting somebody through that, are we really going to criticize it? If God is going to use that instrument, are we really going to speak against what God's going to do through that? Because when we get to the next bit, you're going to see that you can tell by the fruit of things, whether it is or is not of the Lord. And so my, the application of this is that we need to be careful about how we, we discern things and how we speak out against different moves of the Holy Spirit. We need to be careful because I don't know about you, I don't want to even like get near that point where I could do that part where like everything else in my life is forgiven, but not that. There's, there's a, a famous uh, uh, a writer who is, he has a fantastic study about Jesus. I mean, his whole career has been about that. And about 10 years ago, he wrote another book. Uh, he, he's actually wrote in a few books on this where he's very anti-charismatic, anti-Pentecostal movement stuff people. And he came out with this book, and I was hopping mad. If you can't tell, this is a very passionate subject for me. And um, I was hopping mad because I'm like, first of all, I know that, like, you must have a good heart behind this because you're not stupid. You're a brilliant thinker. But when, like, he would give talks about this or, like, even just, like, the mention of these different things, I'm like, brother, you are so dangerously close to blaspheming the Holy Spirit right now because you are criticizing what the Lord is doing or what the Lord even might be doing through these other movements and things. And you're calling it evil. You're calling it strange. And so, I digress. You can go to the next slide. I don't think, yep, you can go to the following slide. We've covered that. Very good. Final point for today. Aren't you glad? <laughs> Here we go. Um, the final thing I see is that the goodness of God's kingdom is revealed by its fruit. The goodness of God's kingdom is revealed by its fruit. You can go to the next slide. And then I'd like you to pull out this handy-dandy little thing. It's called a hymnal for those of you who aren't it even says it on, on the book. It says a hymnal. Uh, please turn with me to page 294, or just numbered, or not 294, ha, 290. And so, forgive me, I don't know this song and this tune, actually. But I know of a reference to our history as a movement through this song. So I just want to read the words. You can read it on your own, too, but... Uh, the title is called Pentecostal Power, and the scripture reference there is from Acts 1.8, where Jesus tells his disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And it says, Lord, as of old at Pentecost, thou didst thy power display with cleansing, purifying flame descend on us today. For mighty works for thee prepare and strengthen every heart. Come, take possession of thine own, and nevermore depart. Verse 3, all self-consume, all sin destroy, with earnest zeal endue, each waiting heart to work for thee, O Lord, our faith renew. And verse 4, speak, Lord, before thy throne we wait, thy promise we believe, and will not let thee go until the blessing we receive. And then the refrain says, Lord, send the old time power, the Pentecostal power, thy floodgates of blessing on us, throw open wide. Lord, send the old time power, the Pentecostal power, that sinners be converted in thy name glorified. Amen. Now, there's a reason I point this out. I was in Bible college, 
I went to Portland Bible College. It's, uh, it's a ministry of what used to be called City Bible Church. It's now called Mana House. That's not important other than as a reference. I was in class. I was serving at one of our churches in our family of churches that we belong to uh, called the Evangelical Church, and I was serving as a worship leader there, wanted to go get trained. When, much to my surprise, I had a teacher who was explaining, you know, talking about the Holy Spirit and kind of sharing his testimony of what brought him to that day. And it turned out that he grew up at one of our churches that was just about a mile away from the one that I was serving at. And he grew up there. He was old by that point. Um, and what was amazing is he and like his youth group that he was a part of, uh, they didn't really have a pastor or a leader for the youth group, so the youth just kind of got together and did their own thing. <laughs> um, but that's not important. What is important is in light of that, they would sing like at church, on a church Sunday, they would sing this hymn. And so then the students, or, you know, the youth, they would get together and they would just pray. And they would, you know, kind of like what the, the, the hymn is saying, like basically, God, we're waiting for you. We're waiting, each waiting heart to work for you, our Lord, our faith, oh Lord, our faith renew. And so what they would do is they would get together and they would pray and they would read the scripture together. And then God started showing up in amazing ways that they couldn't really explain otherwise, other than they were noticing all these other kind of Jesus movement stuff that was going on, that the Holy Spirit was moving in people's lives and people were being saved and they were being delivered and they were being filled with the Holy Spirit. And so the pastor of that church, that this is the history part, the pastor of that church um, was like, wow, this is amazing. Our students are on fire for the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. And so they had some speaker come out, and uh, before the service, the speaker was using the pastor's office to pray and kind of get his mind around the message, and um, the guy was praying in tongues. And within our movement, we are, even though we are big Holy Spirit people, that was a big deal for him as a pastor. And so he came down very hard and crushed the hearts and the spirits of the youth and basically stamped it out. And following that, our, our tribe, we, for a period of time, we had a statement on tongues and our, our book of polity and beliefs and everything. And I think we blew it. I think through that action that maybe even with all the right motivation of wanting just to not, if we don't agree with it theologically or something, like all the right motivation that is it possible that we grieve the Holy Spirit in that time because if we did, that is a grievous thing. It's grave to do that. And only now, I would submit to you, has that church started to recover. It split the church. It drove kids away from the Lord because that pastor came down like a mighty gauntlet of just like smashing it out. And yet they used to sing, and I don't know if they do anymore. I haven't talked to the pastor there, but they used to sing this hymn, Pentecostal Power, where as we're singing, we're inviting the Lord, saying, Lord, bring that Pentecostal power as of days of old. Now, fast forward to today. There are lots of movements and things. There's, I mean, we're not the only denomination out there, and that's okay. Um, and yet God is on the move in so many different ways. It's amazing and terrifying because it's hard to keep it all straight. That's why we need some of those litmus test things to, to, to anchor us in the word, to help us to know, 
okay, this is what God's Word says, this is what it doesn't say, this is not just how we would theologically try to apply it, but that we, you know, God, we're open to what you would have for us today. And so, I would submit to you that there's a lot going on, and there's a lot of good going on. Let's observe, because Jesus makes it very clear in that moment, you can tell a tree by its fruit. And so, let's not do what, what our movement at one time may have been guilty of, and like, just smashing it out, and like, I think that 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 particular act may have been a very evil thing to have done, and I don't know, I don't know that pastor personally, who, who was that person, that was way before my time, but let's not be that church, please. Let's soberly look at things, reason it out, use the scripture to say, God, is this not just with a skepticism, but like an openness and saying, God, we want what you have for us. We're open to you, and we want what you want for us. That's my heart for you. That's my heart for me, that we would be open to what God has, open to the good, not to be a Pharisee, not to be just, you know, a part of the crowd that's super skeptical, but like almost really having that simple faith to say, okay, God, I see that you're working that way, and I'm just going to trust you with it.